Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. So welcome to church. Amen. Good morning, fellowship. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you have given us this time to come to the fellowship and worship you. Father, we pray that this morning as we honor your name, as we worship you, your name will be glorified. Father, we pray and thank you for giving us this day. This is the day that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father, this morning we are grateful that we are here. We have got this gift of life. We thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning and thank to be you, here Jesus. this morning. We know some are in sick, lying in sick beds. But Father, we thank you that for the health that we are able to be here. Father, thank this you. morning we lift your name high. And we thank you that we have given us another chance, another opportunity. Father, this morning as we come, let your name be glorified. Let your name be exalted this morning. Father, this morning as we pray, the word of God says that bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And bless the Lord, his holy name, with all that is within me. Father, you, this Father. morning as we, we glorify your name. We thank, thank you, you that we don't thank forget you your benefits, you everything that you've done in our life. We thank you, Father, for forgiving our sins, Lord. Father, we thank you, Father, for restoring our lives from destruction. Father, we thank you for healing us, Lord. Father, we thank you that you crown us with your loving kindness and tender Amen. mercies every day. You, Father, Lord. we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. We worship you in Jesus' mighty thank name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We've... We've been talking about forgiveness. We've been talking about unforgiveness. Last week, we sort of got through halfway of what I wanted to share with you because God was busy with us. And I really want us to recognize that when God put this together, God doesn't... When God decrees something, the wages of sin is death. That's what Jesus said. That's what God proclaimed. If I walk in sin, the wages of my sin is death. The penalty for me willfully sinning is the death sentence. And I shared with you that God is a just God. And I showed you that what God did with the angels because of their rebellion, and now we've come along and we've done our rebellion, God is a just God. The same punishment is there for both of us. And the, the rebellion that we did, God took this personally. It was something that severely, severely wounded God. He was crushed by our rebellion, by our willful rebellion. There was even a time where God looked at his creations and said, I am sorry I made them. But God always wanted us to come back to him. He wanted a relationship with us. How did God deal with his broken heart when it came to us? You know, when we think about it, when we think about somebody who has really crushed you and really wounded us, the first thing we do is we close our hearts to them. We close ourselves off to them. We want nothing to do with them. And when we hear about something that has happened to them, we almost want to celebrate. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We need to follow God's example. God get, kept his heart open because he loves us. While we were his enemies, God loves us. 
He looks at, a, at his creation and he knows that his wrath must be on us because of our rebellion. But he loves us. So God had to come up with a solution for this decree. If you rebel, you will have a death sentence. So God had to make something up. He needed to fulfill the requirement of the penalty of the sin. And God did. And He did that because He loves us so much. God's solution was He will make a way that that death penalty would be paid by a sinless substitution. So the wages of sin is death. The penalty of my rebellion is death. Finish and claw. But God loves me so much that He wanted, He had to, He is there, He's making a way that there would be a sinless substitution for my death. Judgment, the result is death. God doesn't want that. He wants us to be in relationship with Him. So He makes a way where there seems to be no way. So what does God do? He decides to intervene on our behalf. God decides that He will intervene on our behalf. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 53 from verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our, face, our faces from him. We hid our faces from Jesus. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want you to picture this. I want you to see this. In heaven, God the Father is crying. His heart is broken because we have woefully rebelled against. He is crushed. He is saddened by what we have done. And he turns to his son. The father turns to his son. And he says to them, he says to his son, you know what? I love these disobedient fossils. I need you to do something for me. They have a death penalty over them. If everything carries on the way it is now, they will die. They will have eternal separation from me. But I need you to do something for me. I need you to go and buy them back. I need you to go through that so that you can redeem them, so that you can 
by, I need a sinless man. My son, I need you. Would you do this for me and for them? Can you imagine that conversation? He is despised and rejected by men. What are people saying about Jesus right now? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as if were, as it were, our faces from him. Many of us hide ourselves in all the philosophies that we can find rather than facing Jesus. We will come up with excuses about why we can be the way we are. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. We don't care and afflicted. But what did he go through this for? He went through this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And what did God do? And the Lord has laid on him, on him, the iniquity of us all. You see, there's nothing I can do. This is not something that I can do. It doesn't matter how good I think I am. You see, there's many people that will tell you when you speak to them and you say, if you had to face God now, if you came into judgment, what would God say to you? How would you feel about entering into heaven? There's many answers that a person gets, but fundamentally the answer is, but I'm not so bad. I've done good things. I fed the dogs. I looked after the cats. I even helped a few humans along the way. But what about your sin? Yeah, but I did good. Yeah, but the penalty for sin is death. Good works doesn't redeem sin. No matter how good you do stuff, and no matter how well you did it, you're still a sinner going to hell doing good things. You see, if I haven't accepted, if I haven't got to the place where I understand what Jesus is for me, it doesn't matter what I have done. On the cross, every sin, past, present, all of my sin, was laid upon him at the cross. He is bruised. He is destroyed on my behalf for me. The Father went to the Son, and guys, I want you to make this personal. I want you to see it. The Father going to the Son and saying, Jesus, will you die for Michael? Because Michael, I love him so much, but he has messed up so bad, and the Wages of sin is death, and he can't pay the price for it. Will you? Will you pay the price for my creation? Will you pay the price for my creation? Remember last week I spoke about we are all created by God. But we have all chosen to walk away from him. We have chosen. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God. Not of works lest anyone can boast. 
every time I read the scripture, and it's been a couple, even my, in my preparation when I was doing this, Isaiah 53 verse 10. I did a sermon on this once over Easter and about the death that Jesus went through on our behalf. And I read this scripture. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise, to crush, to kill him, Jesus. It pleased the Father to kill the Son. He has put him to grief. Because remember what Jesus went through. He experienced all that sin upon him. He experienced the pain of that. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Because it pleased God to kill his son for me, now I can prosper in his hand. But it pleased God. I, I want you to hear this. It pleased God to kill his son for your sin so that you can have relationship with him. The father didn't want you to go to hell. The father didn't want anyone to go to hell. Jesus died for everyone. He wants to buy every single soul back. So he paid the price to buy every single soul back. I want you to understand it. The price that needs to be paid for all the sin's death. The penalty of sin is death. All of the sin. It's not just a selected, okay, you, you, I'm paying for you, you and you. you no, you, you, sorry, sorry about that. There was none of that. God paid for everyone. Now you must choose. Jesus paid for everyone. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. It's not only, listen, I'm paying the price for you. Now you can come and be with me. No, I'm paying the price for you so that you now not only can enter in, but you can enter in with Jesus' righteousness upon you. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. You are covered with his righteousness. When the Father looks at you, he no longer sees you as the person that rebelled against him. He sees you as his son and as his daughter. In right standing before him. My goodness. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? God was pleased to send his son because he loves us so much. How much does God love you? Romans 5 verse 6 and 8 to 8 says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, we didn't have strength when we were the ungodly. And we were ungodly, but God died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't that we repented. It wasn't that we changed our ways. And now Jesus died for us. It was while we were in our mess, Jesus died for us. Now what are you going to do with that? You see, that's the thing and that's the question. 
It is paid. It is done. John 17, verse 23, the second part of it. And that the world may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. God loves you and me the same as he loves Jesus. I want to say that again. God loves you and me the same as that have done all of this in rebellion. God loves us the same as he loves his son. The same. Hallelujah. And that the world may know that you, God, the Father, have sent me, the Son, and have loved them, us sinners, as you, the Father, has loved me. God has the same amount of love for you and for me. So I want you to understand this for a moment. God has the same amount of love for you and for me as his son. God has the same amount of love for the man out there, the woman out there, that are denying him and saying, I don't care about God. God has the same love for them as for his father, as for his son. The Father has the same love for every person created because Jesus died for everyone. The payment of our sin, the payment of the world's sin was on Jesus. And Jesus satisfied it. 1 John 4 verse 9 says, In this, the love of God was manifest. It was shown toward us that God sent His Son, His only begotten Son, into the world that we might live through Him. In, th in this is love. Not that we love God because we didn't at that time, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Now that's quite an important word for us to understand. That word propitiation means that the amount paid, the, the amount that is given, Everything that is done to fulfill the requirement of the debt is not just a bare minimum. It is over and above the requirement that is needed so that the person who is looking at and seeing the judgment, the judgment for sin is death. I look at this and I can see this overwhelming payment that has been done on behalf of me, for my debt, it's been paid, but not only has it been paid in full, it's been paid so much so that the person who is looking at it can smile and say, I am pleased with the payment. How do we know that the father was pleased with the payment that the son made on our behalf? I've heard many people say, and there's many examples, and you can hear where many people will tell you that I don't think that my sin could have been paid for. I don't think that Jesus could pay for my sin. How do we know that Jesus paid for all sins and it was paid in full? How do we know that? We know that because Jesus went back to heaven. You see, sin cannot be in heaven. And Jesus, all the sin was placed on him. And if he didn't pay the sin in full, when he got to heaven, there would still be sin on him and he would not be able to enter into heaven. But he went into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And because of that, we have the Holy Spirit today. So we wouldn't have the Holy Spirit and he wouldn't be allowed back in heaven if the payment wasn't enough. It's enough. The payment is done. It is fulfilled. Your debt 
is done. Michael must die for his sin, signed in full by the judge. Here is your pardon. There's your pardon. Come and receive your gift of pardon. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know about it. (laughs) Just come and receive this gift that I've given you. It's a gift that no one, you didn't work for it. No, I'm going to make sure I'm good enough. You can do good works for death. No, you can't. If you have a death penalty, you can't. There's your pardon. It's signed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the full price. Come and receive the pardon. And when you receive the pardon, the only thing you can do is repent of what you've done because when the reality of what's happened hits your heart, you cannot stay the same. You can't stay the same. You cannot say, Jesus died for me and because of God's grace, I can carry on doing what I'm doing. There's no change to my life. Then you do not understand this. You do not understand that I am receiving His righteousness. And He took all my filth and He put it on. There's an exchange. And that exchange, He paid the full price. I have His righteousness. If I've got Jesus' righteousness on me, I'm going to carry on doing my life the way I did. How? How? then I do not value, then I do not embrace. And that is a lie from hell because that is how the world is seeing that so-called people that are children of, that are Christians. Let's rather use that too. People that are Christians are on their way to hell because they are embracing the fact that Jesus died, but they're not embracing the fact that I must repent. You see, I cannot carry on in my sin. I have to stop. If I receive righteousness, what does that mean? Right standing with God? I'm receiving Jesus' righteousness, so I'm in right standing with God. Now I'm just going to carry on. I have to repent. A child of God. A child of God is somebody who you are awakened by what happened. It's like the lights go on, your eyes are opened, and you recognize what He's done for us. God sent His Son so that I actually can receive His forgiveness. And I receive his forgiveness of me by embracing what is done for me and changing. Not staying the same. So I'm a murderer and I'm saying, thank you, Lord, that you've paid the price for me, but I'm going to carry on killing. But I acknowledge you that you paid the price for me, but I'm going to carry on killing. Yes, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, but I'm going to carry on killing. That's not what it does. You see, because God, when you encounter God, there's a change of heart. And if your heart is not changed, you didn't have an encounter with God. How do you know? Well, you changed. My life is a BC life and a Christian life. There is definitely a change in my life. If somebody says they are a child of God or a Christian and their life has not changed, they must understand that liars go to hell. It's included in all the people that go to hell. Liars, fornicators, drunkards. Liars. Are we lying to ourselves? How did God make a way? 
God has paid this full price for me, and He's given me this gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Come and receive the gift. Come and have what I have in store for you. John 3 verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. John 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Jesus died for everyone. The free gift is for everyone. We must embrace that and we must believe. I must humble myself. I must surrender myself to believe that I am not worthy of this. I cannot do this. I must embrace what God did for me. I must understand that that, that pardon that has been given to me, that pardon is not something I can buy. It is not something I can earn. It is not something I can do anything for. But God is saying it's for you to live a life free from the bondage of sin and death. And I embrace it. I come and I take it. And because I embrace it, my life changes. Everything I do, oh, because I have the pardon, guess what? I've now got a manual for life. And this manual tells me how must I be a husband? How must I be a father? How must I live my, how must I handle my finances? How must I plan for my life? What must I do? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this day, because I am forgiven, I am pardoned. Everything that I did, Jesus took upon himself and paid the price for it. And there is now no more condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The only reason why I won't accept this gift is because pride is too much. It's too... I'm... I'm yeah, whatever. Yeah. I don't know about this Christian stuff. Let me tell you about a few philosophies about karma and about stuff and about energies and the right crystals. Those are all philosophies of man. And the moment we try and take philosophies of man and we make them more than what God did. That's an abomination. It's, we are so deceived. We are so deceived. Man, I have to read this to you. I, I have been, in preparation for this, I've been sidetracked so many times because of some of the stuff that's going on right now in the world. There's a whole re-debate about abortion and women's rights and all of that. Romans 1, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised his good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. It is his earthly life in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what we've spoken about now. The, the, the fact that the price was paid, Jesus was raised from the dead and received into heaven. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey. You see, you can believe about something but not obey. You can pretend. And when we believe and obey, we bring glory to His name. 
And you are included amongst these Gentiles. We are included. I am writing to all of you in Rome. God is showing us the price is paid in full. Now we read about this in Romans. Then he talks about the good news. And if we go through the rest of it, for, uh, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. Verse 18, But God shows His anger from heaven against all some, against some sinful people, against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God, but because he has made it, because he has made it obvious to them. Verse 20, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of, of what God was like. As a result, in their minds, they became dark and confused confused claiming to be wise they instead became utter fools and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God they worshiped idols made to look like men people and birds and animals and reptiles so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things that God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. This is why God abandoned them to their own shameful desires. Even the woman turned against their natural way of having sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the, pe the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, you see, when we get so caught up in our sin, that our sin is so important to us, we do not acknowledge God as God. He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things they should never have done. They, their lives become full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, Every day, how many children are being murdered? Quarreling, deception, malice, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They break their promises and are heartless and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. They know it. Yet, they do it anyway. Worse, they encourage others to do it. Our world is calling evil good and good evil. That is what's happened. Why? Why? Because we do not receive this gift. We do not acknowledge God as God. We want to acknowledge God as God, but I still want to carry on doing what I'm doing. I want to do whatever I want to do. 
Because you see, as long as I don't do anything that hurts you, then I'm fine. Salvation is by faith. And faith in who? Faith in God. Faith in the work that God did. Faith in the fact that I am pardoned. I am not only pardoned, I'm pardoned because of the total price that was paid. Do you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus didn't go through a process? Okay. He went through dire straits. He was beaten. He was broken. He was destroyed. So that your sin and my sin could be paid for. But not only our sin, everyone's sin. Every single person. All creation. Jesus paid the price for all creation. And the offer of pardon is to you and everyone who is far off. Nah, I'll get that later. <laughs> it's okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have a bit of fun first. God forgives me of all my sins. But then I'm also hearing that God forgives me, but forgives me as I forgive others. But I'm forgiven. But then God doesn't forgive me because I didn't forgive others. No, that, that's confusing. Have you ever wondered how that all works? I'm forgiven. Jesus paid the price, but I'm not forgiven because I didn't forgive someone. Let's, let's understand this. Um... You guys have got a slide that I would like you to put up there for me. Matthew 6 verse 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Man, this is so confusing, eh? God is forgiving me, my the penalty of my rebellion is death. Jesus paid the price, but now I'm not forgiven because I didn't forgive my wife for what she did. How does that work? They're in two different areas of our life. We need to understand. Go to that slide for us, please. So if we go to this, God's forgiveness to me for what I have done is about redemption. Jesus paid the price so that I am redeemed. Because I am redeemed, I'm going to heaven. Okay, so you're going to heaven. Okay, that wasn't... <laughs> okay, listen. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Okay, then, all right. Okay, so that's here. So I'm going to heaven because the, the, the problem is all of mankind, and Jesus redeemed me so that I can go to heaven. That is what has happened. But our forgiveness, our forgiveness, I do not forgive you for what you did to me. That means it impacts my life on earth. Remember, we started this whole process of the fact that there was this um, servant who was forgiven much, and then he went and he grabbed the guy that had little and said, you owe me. And they brought him back to the king and the king said, you will be handed over to the tormentors. So this is what happens. The problem, our forgiveness, a forgiveness for relationship. It's relationship between you and me. It's not about me being redeemed. Jesus paid the price. That forgiveness is paid for completely. I'm going to heaven. But over here, there's a relationship between you and me. And I need to understand that I forgive so that that relationship is clean. I need to understand that the focus of God's forgiveness is focus is on life and death. But the focus on our forgiveness, when we forgive, God can't forgive me because I haven't forgiven, that focus is life before death. It's how I live now on this earth. 
The problem, the requirement of, of the death penalty is death, separation, but Jesus paid the price. The requirement of our forgiveness, I need to forgive so that there is relationship on earth. And I will not be handed over to the tormentors on earth. I must recognize that if I do not forgive people on earth because I am forgiven, God has forgiven me. I'm forgiven. Now I'm not forgiving you. So what happens? My entry to heaven, done and dusted. But my life on earth becomes a torment because I walk around with unforgiveness. That becomes a chain around my neck. God's compassion is for us. Our compassion... <laughs> Do we really have compassion for others? No, not so much. Eh? I can't forgive you. I cannot forgive what you did to... What did you do to the Lord? And God forgave you, but you... And then for the next six months, all you can think about is that person and what happened, and you can't even think about, you can't function. That person knows nothing. They're having coffee and bits, and you, who's been tormented? You hand it over to the tormentors. Will God forgive us? Of course he has. He's forgiven us. We, we, we are redeemed. Will we forgive others and ourselves. Now next week I'm going to talk about that forgiveness of ourselves and others, how that all works. But that's about earth. Yeah, in our lives, are we forgiving people? We are saved from the torment in hell. When I forgive others, I'm saved from the torment on earth. There's a few more. Torment never stops after death. If your penalty, if you do not receive the pardon, if you do not accept the free gift that God has given you, you will be handed over and go to hell and torment will never stop because you didn't receive the, the gift, the free gift. So your torment never stops. The moment you forgive, your torment on earth stops. You, you release the person. Okay, I forgive you. I let go. Whoosh, ah, I'm going to hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I speak Jesus into the situation. Thank you, Lord. Now, sometimes God will restore relationships with those people completely. And sometimes God won't. Remember, to forgive somebody doesn't mean they become your buddy again. Eh? Sometimes you forgive them and you let them go. And the further they go, the better it is for you. But you forgive them. Because you've got to let go of what's going on in your heart. Because that's where everything is a problem, in our hearts. Believe and you shall be saved. Okay, first verse eight, um, number eight. Faith in Christ, He stood in the gap for me. He is my substitute. And He died for me. Obedience to God's forgiveness, that's a requirement. I need to recognize that I must be obedient to what God says. God says, forgive. So I must be obedient to what His Word says. It's not by faith that I am now forgiving. I must do it. And then I ask God to give me more faith so I can do it better. Um, believe and you shall be, sa be saved. Forgive and you shall be set free. Those two phrases, I think, are so well put together. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. Forgive, and you will be set free. And you will be free indeed because of Jesus. But Christ's work for our forgiveness, everything he did was for our forgiveness. My work is of forgiveness for other people. I still have to do that. That's something I've got to do. Christ is a gift for everyone. Our gift is to anyone. Who has given you a hard time? I want you to think about that right now. Who is that one person? <laughs> Can you think of that person? Now I want you to say, I 
forgive you. Say it. I forgive you. Now you know it's not real, eh? Don't lie to yourself. So how do you do it? You say, I forgive you. I am releasing you. I'm, you see, because you don't forgive them, so you hold on. No. I'm letting go. I am releasing you from the prison that I've kept you in in my heart. I'm letting you go. I'm releasing you. I'm forgiving you. For everything that you did to me, I'm forgiving you. Why? Because God said so. Not because you earned that forgiveness, because God said so. So I'm going to forgive you. And maybe I'll never see you again. I forgive you. But maybe it's a relationship that when you forgive, there can be restoration. That can also happen. But forgive and let go. You will never forget. Forgive and forget. That's what God does. Us, forgive and forget. No, no, we put a monument up. We... You're too quick. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is discipline. That's very important to understand. If I'm forgiven, I'm going to heaven. Now I yach on. Now I do things I shouldn't be doing. God will discipline me. He will hand me over to the thing, to the, the tormentors, to the stuff. We suffer consequences of our actions. And many of us suffer, suffer consequences because of our sin and the craziness of our lives. We suffer that. I'm, I'm just now realizing we still got the lights on. What's with these guys? Thank you, Lord. I'm waiting for the lights to go off, the lights to go off, the lights to go off. Let your light so shine. Hallelujah. Our church shines in Jesus' name. We've got to understand that there will always be a consequence of our actions. So we've got to understand and recognize that. We've got to align our behavior to what God says. So that on earth I'm not tormented because I'm a child of God. But if I'm not a child of God, you'll watch my life as a pleasure. Because I haven't accepted, I haven't accepted the gift of I am forgiven, I am set free from the obligation of sin, rebellion, death. That's hanging over my head. No, <laughs> it's okay, I, I can carry on. Do you know that's going to happen? No, that's, you guys wrote, somebody wrote that so that we can tell our kids so that they can behave. It's some fairy tale story. No, it's not. If there's one thing I can tell you from where I come from, I met God. He changed my life. It's not a fantasy, it's not some story, it's real. Without God, I don't even want to be with me. But with God, He changed my life. 1 John 4 verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. I live because of Jesus. I don't live because of Michael and Michael's choices. I choose Jesus. I live through him. In this is love. Out of the relationship with Jesus, I now can love. If I don't have the relationship with Jesus, I can't love. I don't have it. It's not there. I can only criticize. I can only... Okay, I'll accept some stuff. I can only be like that. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for us. He paid the full price and God was pleased with the full price that was paid. And finally, 1 John 4 verse 9 and 10. 
God showed how much he loved us by sending his son. This is in the New Living Translation. The one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life. Isn't it time that we, had it, we were sure of our eternal life? And this is real love. Who do you need to forgive? Now, when we started this journey, there was some confusion that was said when a person that, if we don't forgive, we can land up going to hell. Why is that statement made? Why is that statement brought when we see clearly that Jesus paid the price for us completely? Do you know about the root of bitterness? If we do not forgive, the root of bitterness can be so twisting in our banister, in our innermost being, we get so twisted. And there are people that are living in torment because they don't forgive people. But they're still maintaining a relationship with God in some way. When they die, they go to heaven. Their torment was on earth because their unforgiveness, the punishment of that unforgiveness is discipline on earth. We just must be careful that if we are in such unforgiveness that our hearts become so twisted that we lose who we are in Christ. We must be aware that when you walk in forgiveness, unforgiveness, and bitterness, it can steal your soul. And eventually, you can lose your way. So that's why I'm saying to you, why mess with that? Who do you need to forgive? Forgive them. Go home. Go to your room. Close the door. Sit down. Think about it. Kneel down. God, I release John, James, Sonny, Frank, Pietrus. I release them. I had to do this to somebody who had molested me, but they had died. And it had an impact on my life, and I only found out about all of this stuff I had buried all the things. So I only found out, it only came to my remembrance later, but by then the guy died. So now you have to deal with it. So you have to deal with it with God, and you have to forgive them and let them go so that that thing no longer dictates the way you live. And it doesn't have an impact on your life now. So you forgive them. I was still going to heaven. I was still on my way to heaven, but I needed to let go of that so it would change my life. And when I let go and dealt with that, it even changed the way that I dealt with my family and did things in my family. There was something that was just there, and I didn't know about it, and God revealed it to me eventually. I was 33, 34 when God revealed this to me. You've got to understand, don't mess with these things. Who do you need to forgive? Why is it so important to forgive? Don't let that person own your life now. They are putting a bondage over you and you are battling because you focused on them and not forgiving them and you focused on the hurt that happened to you. Remember... Two weeks ago, last week, we spoke about vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Whatever happened, just give it to God. And God will do it on your behalf. But you must let it go and give it to Him. And God will sort it out. I have absolute 100% assurity that God will do it on my behalf. So I leave it to Him. And I can walk Set free and free indeed. 
because Jesus has set me free. Not only from the sin of my past, but the sin of my present stuff that is a bondage on me. I'm free. Please accept that gift as well and let go and let God deal with it and you walk free and out of the bondage of unforgiveness. Let's bow our heads. Father God, you know every one of our hearts. You know how we are. You know there's nothing that you do not know about us. And right now, Lord, I pray for every person that is dealing with unforgiveness in some shape or some form, a hurt that has been done to them, a hurt that they have gone through, a wound that has been laid upon them through whatever means it has come. I pray for that person right now, Lord. Father, by your Holy Spirit, give them strength. Your grace and your mercy, Lord, give them strength so that they can release that person that has caused the wound. That they can just open up their hearts and let that person out of their heart and fill their heart with the love of God. Just you. Let ugliness out. Let it go. And we give it to the Lord. God, I'm handing these people over to you. You have your way with them. Vengeance is mine. Lord, I pray that you will do what you need to do with these people that have wounded me. Whatever, you do it, Lord. I am releasing them out of me, out of my heart, to you, Father. I let go and I let God. Father, I pray for every person that is feeling that within themselves. Strengthen them now in the name of Jesus. Fill them with your love. Fill them with your compassion. Fill them with your mercy so they can let it go. Show them how precious they are to you, Lord. That none of these things will keep us in bondage. Unforgiveness will not cause us to be in a place where bitterness and the root of bitterness destroys our lives to such an extent that we don't even know who you are anymore. We forgive because we have been forgiven. We let go because, Lord, you have released us. We have been pardoned. So, Father, we hand this over to you so you can deal with what needs to be pardoned. I can't anymore. I don't want to anymore. I am tired of being in bondage to this thing. Right now, I let it go. In Jesus' name. If you are in agreement with that prayer, just say amen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Remember the devil wants to keep you stuck. As long as the devil can keep you stuck, you are not who you should be. God wants you to be unstuck so you can become the person he created you to be. Amen.